Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 2020 Girls College Co Hockey Night. Um, I am thrilled that you have been able to join us, and I hope everybody out there is staying healthy and safe during this crazy pandemic times. Um, we, we brought everybody together today to kind of give you some insight on what can be done during this pandemic to get yourself in front of college coaches and scouts, even though there's not a lot of college hockey going on right now, um, let alone any type of club hockey. And we also wanted to give you some insight on your health, your nutrition, you know, your nutrition, how to stay in shape, what you can do after um, hockey, whether you choose to play in college or not, there's still a lot of opportunities out there for you. So I would like to introduce my panelists today. Um, we do have one more that's gonna be joining us in a little bit. I wanna start with Katie Holmgren. She is with USA Hockey. She is the Director of Program Services. Taylor Gross, who is a Manager for Program Services, also with USA Hockey. Jennifer Wilson, Head Coach, Women's Hockey, Lake Forest College, D3. Michelle Lichterman, who is our America Showcase Illinois Girls Head Coach, as well as an Iowa official. She can tell you her other trades as well when she starts talking. And then Laura Johnson, the AHI Registrar, and John Dunn, um, our Executive Director for AHI. Lori Markowski, uh, the Girls Director for Chicago Bruins, will be joining us in a bit. She is um, actually en route right now, so she's trying to get in. Um, all of these women are, are phenomenal women in their own rights, and they have played hockey in one, one form or another, whether it's been club, high school, college, all of the above, mm -hmm. and they all are still involved, maybe not always on the ice, but they are all still heavily involved in the hockey industry and community, and they all bring such great information to tonight's webinar. So without anything further, I would like to present Katie Holmgren from USA Hockey. She will take over and she'll give you a little bit of background on herself and what she'll be talking about tonight. Katie? Thanks, Anita. Hi, everybody. Um, so as Anita mentioned, I am the Director of Program Services for USA Hockey. So um, not everybody always knows what that means and it doesn't really describe what our job is at USA Hockey, but uh, Program Services is a department that exists to help our local associations get players um, to play hockey at the youngest levels. So um, we work really hard on try hockey for free days and helping support our local youth associations that way. And we also provide support to our administrators. Um, people like Anita who work really hard behind the scenes on uh, getting people into the game and, and keeping things moving for you guys there at AHI. So that's a really brief overview of what our department does. I don't wanna spend too much time on that, but um, so some of the background for me, I grew up in Minnesota, so another hockey state similar to Illinois, and I started playing hockey in high school. I had been around it my whole life. Um, I had skated growing up, and then I went to college at Iowa State, and I had no intention of being an athlete there. I wanted to go into marketing, and about two weeks into being in school there, someone said they had an ACHA club team. So that was very early on the women's side of the ACHA, so it wasn't quite as organized as it is now where they recruit a lot and you have a lot of opportunity to get in front of ACHA coaches and you might know a lot about the program. I knew nothing about it. And so I went to an off-ice practice. They were doing some dry land. I spoke to the coach. Uh, I went to tryouts and that was kind of history <laughs> itself for college. So that quickly became obviously having played and, and being from Minnesota and being around it my whole life. I decided to play. Uh, the great part about that for me was it gave me a lot of leadership opportunities while I was in college. Um, I was the fundraising chair for our team. I was the president for two years. I was the captain for two years. And so for me, that really kind of shaped how I got into working in sports um, because I had so many opportunities to do that on my ACHA team. So I already had taken leadership roles and gotten experience there, which was pretty valuable on my resume. So I was a sport management major and in at Iowa State that required us to do an internship. My first internship was, my only internship was in baseball. So minor league baseball, not something I was super interested in, but like went into it head first, got great experience. And before my internship was over, um, there was a new minor league hockey team starting up in back in Iowa. 
And so I went to work for the Iowa Stars, which at the time was the American League affiliate of the Dallas Stars. And so it was a startup team. So talk about another great experience. We were doing everything. So it was the first year of the team. I was in ticket sales and group sales, but we really helped with everything. So it was really cool to see that organization kind of get off the ground. Um, working in minor league sports. So I had done my internship was in minor league baseball. And then my first full-time job was in minor league hockey. I had a ton of experience when you were in minor league sports, typically you get a more well-rounded experience. You get to see kind of a little bit of what everybody does and sort of have a hand in everything. So that was really fun for me. I moved out to Colorado a little less than a year later to work for the Colorado Rockies, the baseball team. And it wasn't really the experience I had hoped for. So some of the stuff I know other people are going to touch on later about confidence and knowing what you want. I think when you work in sports, it should be really, really fun and it should be rewarding. Um, full honesty, you don't always go into it for the money. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really a love of the sports. So I didn't necessarily like my experience there as much as I did the other two places. Um, it was a little more siloed and, and um it just wasn't what I thought I wanted out of a, a full-time job. So I was there for about a year and a half. I learned a lot of lessons, just like you do on the ice, about what you don't want. Um, in a, you know, what I wouldn't want to be like if I was supervising people, um, what I wanted to ask for moving forward. I was pretty young, early 20s. And so I got out of sports for a little while. Um, two years later, I was living in Colorado Springs already. And the same person that had hired me to work for the hockey team in Iowa was working at USA Hockey. And he reached out to me and said, Katie, there's a job opening at USA Hockey. It's the coordinator of adult women's hockey. I think you should apply for it. I know you got out of sports. If nothing else, I wanna come introduce you to all the people at USA Hockey since you live in Colorado Springs and it's right here. He knew I had wanted to get into coaching. Um, I was still playing on a women's league and made great friends through that. And so um, needless to say, I got the job. <laughs> Long story short there. So I spent the first couple years at USA Hockey as the coordinator of adult women's hockey. And really what my role was, was to grow on the adult women's side and serve that portion of our USA Hockey membership. So as many of you on this call know, there's player development camps that happen on the youth side. People tend to focus on what USA Hockey does for national teams. Mine was purely recreational and really helping that membership grow and knowing that they had somebody that was really taking their best interests in mind. So. If you don't know, we do have um, nationals, not only for youth, which I know a lot of you are aiming to go to, and that's a big thing every year, but we also do it for adult women. And so that was a really fun group for me to work with because I was obviously playing adult hockey, so I had a lot of experience there. Uh, the other cool part about the adult department was that the ACHA falls under the adult department at USA Hockey. So it was great for me to see, having played in the ACHA several years before when it was kind of getting off the ground on the women's side, to really be able to work with that portion of our membership as well. So it's been cool to see the growth there, the talent level raising so much higher than it was when I was playing in the ACHA. And um, I've gotten really lucky. I got to go overseas with our World University Games team, um, our women's team, the last five times they've gone. And so that's been really cool and helped shape those teams. And, and a lot of what I did with those teams, we'd be sitting around, there's lots of time on buses. Um, going back and forth to rinks in other countries. And so I had a lot of time to share my experiences with those um, young women as well. So that was really fun for me. I got promoted to the manager of adult hockey a couple years later. And so I really oversaw all of our events planning. So not just on the women's side, but kind of across the board, had a greater role with communicating with the ACHA and um, really just kind of grew in that role. So two years ago, I was asked to come over to the program services team and kind of oversee and revamp what we do there on a growth side and an administrator support side. And so the, the great part for me is all these experiences I've learned, I, I go back sort of to the Rockies pieces, I learned what to ask for when I wanted it. So when I got my promotion, I already had some confidence built up and, and, and asked for certain things and certain levels of support um, just having been at the organization now, I've been there 10 years, so it's a little bit easier once you learn the ins and outs of the job. Um, I think in sports, like I mentioned, it should be really fun, and I love what we get to do. So we're kind of in the background when you look at USA Hockey. We're not working, although I have been at player development camps. So if anyone's on the call and I look familiar, that's why, because <laughs> I've been lucky to work with our girls' women's section. 
um, and our ADM departments have gotten to do a lot of things. And all of that for me has been because of relationship building. So when I mentioned that my boss at the guy who hired me in Iowa at the minor league team asked me to apply for the job at USA Hockey, that was all relationship building. Um, he introduced me to a lot of people. I certainly would say that I got the job myself um, through the interview process, but that kind of foot in the door and those introductions. So um, that's a really brief overview of, of my background and getting to the position that I'm in. But um, now as a director of a department, the, the higher up you get, the more you kind of get to see how things work. And I really took my time and learned, but um, relationship building is hugely important. And, and the networking piece was really important for me. And so I guess the thing I would say is you go into college, whether you're looking to play or coach. Um, I now coach a boys high school team in Colorado Springs. And I have, this is my fourth season coaching. And that was also um, somebody just saying, hey, we really want a different voice on the ice for these guys. They're used to kind of the old school way of coaching. I had coached, um, youth girls hockey here locally for quite a few years um, and kind of got to move up to now I'm coaching high school. So all of that happened through networking. It's never too early to start networking. And remember that whenever you guys are in front of a coach or if you're at a camp, um, anybody might be noticing your hockey skills, but also your personal relationship skills. So be sure you're talking to people. You know, if you if you have a question for somebody, if you have a job you're interested in and there's somebody that you know at USA Hockey that works there that you can reach out to and, and ask for advice or a reference or a recommendation for anything, um, I think even beyond coaching or playing, um, there's so many different things you can do with sport. I've been lucky to do a lot of different things with other sports. And then obviously hockey is my passion. So I'm so lucky to have been at USA Hockey for 10 years and I hope it keeps growing. Um, we're really lucky we get to work with people all over the country and that networking piece is huge and, and really helps me enjoy what I do at my job. Thank you, Katie. Um, I, I forgot to mention before I introduced Katie that if any of you out there do have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A chat so that we can definitely go ahead and, um, and, and make sure that we get those questions answered for you. Um, anything you put in the Q&A chat, all the panelists can see it, and, you know, one or all of them may jump in. So please don't be afraid to um, ask those questions. That's what we're here for tonight. So next up, I'd like to introduce Taylor Gross, who is also with USA Hockey, and she is the manager, one of the managers in program services. Taylor, take it away. Hi, I'm Taylor Gross. I'm the manager of program services um, at USA Hockey, so I work with Katie. Um, I have been at US Ho USA Hockey for a little bit over a year. Actually, November 4th um, is my work anniversary, so kind of a crazy year um, to start with, but I guess that makes it easier going forward when things are a little bit more normal. Um, so... <laughs> Um, just excited to, to be here. Thanks for having me on. Um, a little bit about my background. I've been involved in hockey forever um, in a lot of different capacities. Um, I grew up playing in Colorado. I'm a Colorado native, uh, born and raised Colorado Springs. Um, I played for the Colorado Select out of Denver. So I drive up to Denver four times a week to go to practice, um, team weekends and things like that. Um, I always knew when I was growing up that I wanted to play college hockey. Um, didn't really know why, but just knew that I wanted to do it because that was, you know, the highest level that you could play. Um, so I actually ended up going to the University of Connecticut for the first half of my college career to play Division One hockey and transferred halfway through, uh, which is definitely not ideal. Um, but I transferred to Penn State when they started their Division One program. Um, so I was their first captain. Um, we had 17 freshmen when I was a senior. There were three of us that transferred over from UConn to Penn State. Um, so that was a challenge in itself. Um, after college, I wasn't necessarily sure what I wanted to do. Um, I did know that I wanted to stay involved in hockey. Um, I got a biology degree at Penn State, which I haven't used once in my life. Um, but I will say I did learn a lot of time management and I learned that I could do anything I set my mind to if I was able to play hockey and get that degree. Um, still super nerds, love, you know, researching viruses and stuff like that. So COVID's great for, or not great for me, but uh, just, you know, interesting, love, love still looking at that. But 
moved back to Denver, um, started coaching within my old association because I really wanted to give back. I loved the organization that I played in. I love my coaches. Um, so coached the U19 AAA team there as an assistant coach for the first half of the season. And then the head coach left uh, halfway through, so I had to take over um, as, a, as a brand new coach uh, right out of college. I barely knew what I was doing, uh, but, you know, did my best and afterwards knew I wanted to, to go to grad school. Um, so started looking at jobs, uh, grad assistant jobs pretty early. Um, and then I came across the listing at Midland University, which is a small um, liberal arts college in Fremont, Nebraska. Um, didn't think anything of it when I saw it. I was like, there's no way I'm living in Nebraska. Um, but ended up doing the interview. They flew me out and I ended up getting the job. So I was a GA there, but I was also the head coach of the women's hockey team, um, which is an interesting situation to be in. Um, and while I was there, I got my master, uh, master's degree in education and leadership in adult and organizational learning, which is very different than biology. Um, after my two years there, uh, kind of similar to Katie, had a situation, uh, wasn't the best situation, wanted to take a break from sports and hockey in general. Um, so started looking at jobs that uh, applied to kind of what my master's degree was in. So I got a job at a big ed tech company called 2U. They're based out of Maryland, but they had an office in Denver. Worked for them for about two and a half years, learned a lot of important job experience, um, you know, something I had never gotten with a biology degree. Um, I spent my entire college career in a lab, um, but learned a lot of things and um, decided I wanted to get back to hockey, but not in a coaching capacity. Uh, so I was looking at USA Hockey website, um, different jobs that are opening. Um, so at the same time, the program services in your, uh, job was opening and then the manager of female hockey for ADM was open. Uh, so kind of read through the two different descriptions and the ADM was more on ice and development stuff. And that was stuff I kind of had been doing my whole life and uh, didn't necessarily want to go back into it. And then when I read the job description for program services, I was like, okay, this is really cool. It's something I've never done in hockey, uh, but I can really use my skill set from my master's degree. And then the two years I, I spent working at 2U to actually make a difference and, you know, get back in the game without actually have to be on ice. Um, so that was cool for me. I've been there for a year. It's been a crazy year, but uh, it, it's been awesome. Um, one thing I do want to touch on confidence wise, um, when Anita, when you asked us to talk about that, um, I was really excited because I'm, I'm 28 years old. Uh, I think that confidence is something that you're always going to have to work on and something that you're always going to be building on. Um, and I am still working on it today. Um, I would say even into my college career, I didn't find confidence until I was halfway through and I did, I was able to get my confidence back for whatever reason I lost it by really focusing on the process and the outcome. Um, so I always knew what I wanted to do. Um, I knew what goals I had, um, but what I had to do was change my mindset to really focus on what I needed to do in order to, to get to where I wanted to be to obtain those goals. So um, when I was able to focus, you know, more at the task at hand, then, you know, what's going to happen if I don't play Division One college hockey? What's going to happen if I don't get that job? Then I was able to, to focus on those little steps. So i um, just happy to be where I'm at now and just constantly learning and you know, just excited to see where it goes. That, that's great, Taylor. Thank you. So, Taylor and Katie, I'm going to put both of you guys on the spot right now. And I'm going to ask you to, if you could give one powerful word to help these young ladies, what would that word be? Man, I don't want to use confidence. We're all going to say that a lot. Um, ooh, that was a good one, Anita. Way to put us I, on the I spot. I know. I, you know, we can always come back to it. I can do it in like a sentence. <laughs> what? I said I could do like a sentence, but... The one word is kind of tough. Well, I, the one I could, mine would be a more of a two word or a couple words okay. would be always be learning. So for me, although I've been here for 10 years and so I, Taylor works for me, if anybody hadn't put those two 
together. So I've been at USA Hockey for 10 years and Taylor's been here for a year. We also play on a women's team together. So we've known each other a little bit longer. I'll also say, you know, she reached out to me, so I knew she wanted the job, but she definitely got the job on her own against quite a few other candidates, but that goes back to some networking too. I didn't know what her major was in when I actually interviewed her and looked at her resume. I was like, this is fantastic. This works great for us, but I would say always be learning. So for me, even though I've been here 10 years and I've been in, you know, at USA Hockey and I've been very lucky to to have a lot of crossover with other departments. And, and that really goes to just relationship building is that I'm always learning. So if there's a process at USA Hockey to get something done, even in our job that I, I necessarily don't like, I wanna understand why so that I'm learning rather than just being frustrated or a process isn't happening necessarily very quickly or you know, always be learning. On the coaching side, I'm four years into coaching high school boys. I am still big time learning what that means, although I love it. Every day that I go to practice as a coach, I'm learning from the young men that I'm coaching. I'm learning from the other coaches that I coach with through their experiences um, and really be open to that learning process. Well, you had said something else, Katie, too, when you were talking about um, how you when, you, when you left the Rockies and when you eventually came over to USA Hockey, that you, you learn to know what you want and what to expect. And, and, and how, how did you do that? I mean, how did you, so did there you, were, I mean, I know it's all confidence, yeah. but, you know, I mean, but like what like triggered that? Was it more like the experiences or was it just something clicked in your mind that you just, I think that's what you a wanted and you were going to go after it? Great question. So my first two job experiences in sports were awesome. My minor league baseball experience was incredible. I had a great mentor boss there who was really good at, you know, he knew we were all still in college. And so he was great. And so like, I learned that I wanted to be that kind of manager if I ever got into that position um, at the Iowa Stars. I loved it. It was cool to learn what it takes to, to get a new team started and off the ground. You know, it's American Hockey League. So you think like they have it all figured out, but a new team. And then I went to the Rockies, a well-established major league baseball team. And it was very siloed. And so really what I had to do was look and, and um, say, am I unhappy because it's not what I expected? Am I unhappy because I'm not giving them what they expected? And that's okay. So that kind of took a long time for me to accept. And what helped me was to get out of sports for a little while. Honestly, not everybody does. Um, I got out of sports for two years because I wasn't enjoying the experience. And so I had to take some time to really figure out what I wanted. And I took all of those lessons into working at USA Hockey. If I didn't like how something was, what about it could I change? Um, and I'm a big teamwork person, Taylor knows that. I'm big on we, not I, although I am very proud of the accomplishments that I've made and the strides that I've made at USA Hockey, not only in our department, but for women in our organization. Um, I, I think it's big to lift other women up it's, you know, if somebody else, if Taylor's doing well, I'm going to say she's doing well. I'm not going to take the credit for it because her doing well makes our whole department do better, which in turn makes the whole company function better, right? So um, I, I'm not one to shy down from speaking up, but I've definitely, some of it definitely comes with age, um, but I'm not shy to speak up when I think someone is being treated wrongly, whether it's myself or someone else at the organization. Um, I, I'm not shy to make suggestions. A big thing for me is if you're going to complain about something, what are you going to do to change it? And so for me, that just kind of took a long learning experience and it is some confidence and some of it comes with age and, and learning the processes that happen. But I'm not going to sit and complain about how something's going if I'm not going to offer a solution as well. I think that's a really big piece that, um, that people are always looking for. If, if I don't agree with something, I'm not just going to say I don't agree with it. I want to have information behind why I don't agree with something. Or if I love something, I'm going to praise it because I think there's so much, especially with the way the world's going right now and kind of crazy times is so many people are complaining and we're all dealing with things we've never had to deal with before. How can I change it to be better for me and the people that I work with? So how can I change things to be better for Taylor and myself so that we can get what we need to get accomplished done in a better way? That's, that's awesome. That, that's absolutely awesome. So Taylor, have you come up with your word yet? <laughs> Not a single word, sentence. but I'll, I'll do a short <laughs> sentence. <laughs> if you want um, to give a sentence, that's fine. So mine would be, don't be afraid to fail. 
um, and I don't like putting like don't in front of sentences, but um, if I like look back and reflect on the type of person I was in high school before I went and played college hockey, the type of person that I was during college, um, I was always scared to make a mistake. I was scared to fail. Um, if I had that figured out at a younger age, and like Katie said, you know, some of it does come with age and experience, um, and, and you always want to be learning, you know, maybe things would have been different if I wasn't scared of failing or scared of making mistakes. So, you know, take risks, um, you know, be vulnerable. <laughs> uh, you, you typically, you know, with confidence, the more you do something, the more confident you're going to be with it. So, you know, and if you do fail, like, it's okay. Um, look at it as a learning, uh, you know, like a, a lesson and, and learn from it. I think a lot of where I've gotten today um, is because I can look back on past experiences and be like, all right, like, if I could do this differently, this is what I would have done. But that's okay. Um, it happened. Like, I can learn from it, and I'm better from it. So um, ask questions, learn from it. Don't be afraid to fail. Find yourself a mentor. Uh, Katie's been awesome. You know, since I've been working here, it's been a crazy, crazy year, but uh, it's, it's, it's been awesome. Well, that's great. Thank you so much, Taylor. Taylor and Katie, that, that you guys, that, that was phenomenal. I really appreciate you guys really taking the time out tonight and being, being here with us. So next up, we have Jennifer Wilson. Um, like I said earlier, she is a, the women's, um, head coach for Lake Forest College, D3. Jennifer, it's all yours. Perfect. Thanks, Anita. Um, so as she said, my name is Jennifer Wilson, a head coach at Lake Forest College. I'm entering my third year with the program. Um, Midwest kid, I actually grew up playing uh, boys hockey, ironically, in Wisconsin, because there weren't people like Anita when I was younger. So I was forced to play boys hockey, which may be some of the story amongst the panelists here. Um, but you guys are in a really fortunate position to have, have USA Hockey kind of dedicate a lot more time to, and AHI for that matter, um, you have so many opportunities to play that that with with other girls, and I think that was something I didn't have growing up. So I admire everybody here tonight, and I, a big thank you if I don't say it enough. So um, makes my job easier as we head up into the the college ranks as well. So, um, but yeah, so I grew up playing playing boys hockey in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, um, and then I got uh, to the hitting age. I guess is the typical girl story, um, and I was getting hurt all the time. Uh, was the ponytail, I think. So I ended up um, asking my parents if I could try out for a AAA team out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It was about two hours away. It was a pretty big commitment. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to get on with the team down there, Wisconsin Wild, which is now the Milwaukee Junior Admirals organization, um, and played for them for, for two years and, and uh, had a fantastic experience, learned a lot. And again, just those, those bonds. I was in uh, my uh, left wings in my senior year of high school's wedding uh, last March. So uh, it was, uh, it's, those bonds kind of carry with you throughout your time. I was fortunate to get recruited out to a, um, a, a D3 team out in New York, Manhattanville College for a year. Um, you know, kind of an interesting theory and theme that we have through all of us is kind of finding that love and losing that love, right, a little bit with sports. So um, ended up at Manhattanville and it was just a little bit too far away from home, you know, and, and having had that experience playing AAA hockey, some of you may feel this as you get a little bit older, I hope not. Um, but a little bit of burnout. I think there's a lot of pressure. Um, there's a lot of commitment. There's a lot of time. And you kind of start looking at your friends going to prom and homecomings and, and you get that feeling. And I, and I hope you never do, because I'm here to tell you, you want to stay in it. You want to commit to it. Um, and you have so many opportunities too. And it is also okay to try new things. Um, I, I'm so, experience, so happy for all the experiences I had. Um, so after that, I kind of focused on, on what life was like outside of hockey ended up at uh, Columbia College studying uh, double majoring in marketing and television production. Was lucky enough to get picked up for an internship out in LA and worked for Paramount Studios for a while. Um, learned a ton there, learned a lot about the, the business in LA and television in general and marketing and that side of things. But I, I thought to myself, the only thing I'm really living, want to live out of my car for, you know, not making any money might be hockey. Um, so I, uh, I was blessed enough to, to get a, a assistant coach job through the networking I had done as a player um, and took a, a position as an assistant coach out at St. Michael's College in Vermont. Um, again, learned a ton, fell back in love with hockey, which was, was really awesome. But there was always a part of me that felt like I didn't really get to fulfill that college part. 
um, sorry, as ironically, playing in a women's game. Uh, probably Katie had a hand in that, playing in a women's uh, nationals. And I had a coach approach me from Robert Morris um, and said, hey, we'll pay for your master's if, if you come, you know, come play or whatever. So, you know, it wasn't that simple of that, that they obviously didn't pay for it. But, um, you know, it was an opportunity I, I couldn't pass up. And even though it was ACHA, you know, I didn't know much about it at the time. I absolutely was was willing to, to take the opportunity to get back and playing and kind of fulfill that college dream. And and uh, I had such a really good experience there. I actually ironically met another panelist, Michelle, who's coming up as an athletic trainer there. Um, and then I think uh, one of the cool things coaches always want to do is coach their alma mater. So I ended up staying on um, about two years after the fact, was asked to come back and coach the team, um, which was just, it was kind of a dream come true for me. It was pretty awesome and kind of helped me um, find my way again back into coaching. So um, ended up there for a few years and then took an opportunity out at Buff State um, really kind of missed my family from Wisconsin and all of my friends back in Chicago, my connections and, and, uh, got approached about Lake Forest opportunity here in, in Illinois. And it was, I couldn't say no. So, um, ended up back in Illinois and I've been here for, for three years now and, um, absolutely love it. It's a, if you haven't been out here, it's a gorgeous program. It's a gorgeous school. So I got to, you know, the lake and of course, obviously the city of Chicago, as you guys all hopefully know, it's fantastic. So, um, my portion tonight is to talk a little bit about uh, college recruiting and the challenges that we're kind of facing in COVID. Um, I guess my, my first thing would be to take a breath. <laughs> um, you know, everybody's in a rush. Is there going to be a spot? How are they going to see me? You know, D1s aren't even at the ranks. Um, we're very, we are very good at what we do. We will find a way to find you. Um, and so, you know, what are ways that you can, you can help us with that? Um, I think you're in a good position. So I think that's why you shouldn't, shouldn't stress so much if you are. Um, you know, technology these days is so advanced from our one, you know, our parents with our camera back in the day filming us, right, where you can't even tell what number it is. So um, I think that you're in a good position. You know, I think that, that uh, you know, getting film of yourself, whether it's at practice, whether it's at games, if you're capable and able to do that, is super important. Um, the one thing I will, you know, don't send us a highlight reel. Um, it's great that you can score goals and you can always connect on that pass, but that's not going to be 10 out of 10 times. We want to see the mistakes. We want to see what you do. Do you slouch your shoulders? Do you slam your stick? Um, you know, do you high five your friend as they come back on the bench? We want to see all of that. Um, so even if you have a full game, there's coaches, we will sit down, we will watch it. Um, so make sure that you're absolutely sending, sending all of it and not just that, not just the good parts of that too. Right. So That'd be my advice. Um, the other advice I do have is to do your research. So in terms of, in terms of as you get older, um, does size of your school matter? Does location matter? Do you want to stay close to home? Do you want your parents to be able to see your games? Do you not care about that? Um, you know, what do you want to major in? Does your school have your major? Um, don't pick a school that doesn't have your major and have to force yourself as you go. It's okay not to know, um, but make a, you know, make a conscious effort to do a little bit of research. Um, on the school. And then the other thing, you know, the NCAA has passed a rule that, that there are going to be players that are coming back for a fifth year um, this season. So I think one of the questions for you that are a little bit older is, coach, how many spots do you have open? Um, how many spots are, are going to be available in the 21 class um, and things like that? So I think, you know, as you're researching schools, take a peek at the roster. Is there a lot of turnover? Are there a lot of girls leaving the program? What is the retention like? Um, and really kind of take the time to just dig into a program. There's nothing more impressive than a recruit calls me and said, oh, I saw your great game against St. Thomas last year when you guys won in overtime. It was awesome. Um, you know, so, so little things like that just go so much, so much further. Um, apply early, apply often. Um, most colleges are probably, you're going to get the eye of the coach a little bit too if you're more serious about that but I definitely think you need to go through those steps and kind of figure out what you want. Visiting is hard right now not a lot of colleges are allowing campus visits um, and even then even if you can it's kind of hard to meet with coaches so it's all kind of up in the air about who's meeting with who um, but almost every single college has a virtual tour link find it watch it see if it's something you can see yourself um, if you're lucky enough to be playing in a tournament or a game out in that area maybe pop in, not, you know, drive around campus, try to get a feel for it. If you can't get a scheduled tour um, is kind of my advice, my advice there. But, um, you know, it's okay too, to be honest. I think that's something we run into in the college level. Uh, 
Sometimes our girls are apprehensive to tell us where else they're looking. We all know each other. Chances are we probably already know. Um, so there's no need to be to be bashful about it or, or shy about it. Um, you know, and, and almost every coach I know is even if you tell us no, going to encourage and support you and you'll have a fan at your next program and you might even end up playing each other. So, um, you know, don't be don't be shy to say no if it's this program that doesn't match your interest um, either. Um, take the time to kind of ask the coach questions, too. Um, one of the things I wish I had done when I was younger was taking the time to ask about different coaching styles and philosophies, like what, what are your beliefs as a coach? You know, what is your team morale like? Things like that. I think it's such an important part. You don't want to end up at a program that isn't a good fit for you. Um, so ask the questions. Don't be shy about it. We like talking about hockey. We like talking about our programs. So, um, you know, I think that also gives you during your recruiting process, I think it gives you a good feel, um, you know, for, for someone that you want to play for. Um, that's going to be a good fit for you and their style. Um, and I think take that into consideration as well when you're making your decisions, because it's a it's a hard decision. You want to, as someone who's transferred, you want to get it right the first time. Um, so I see Taylor nodding as well. <laughs> so, um, you know, so I think and there's nothing wrong with transferring by any means either, but it's an it's expensive decision. It's a, it's a serious decision. Um, so take the time to kind of research and, and find the, the best fit for you. So yeah, get your videos together, get your player profiles together, send your schedules to us, send us our video links if you have them, um, anything you can do for us to kind of help out in this process. And like I said, don't stress, it's all, we'll, we'll find you, so. Then I, I have a quick question for you that, you know, maybe, you know, some of the, the young ladies out in the, in the, uh, the attendees are, are, are probably asking themselves, is how do they, can they go on, on a college's website and track down like contact information for a coach? Yeah, so a lot of the coaches' uh, emails and even their office phone numbers will be listed online. Right now with everything going on, I probably wouldn't recommend calling the office, but they do go to their voicemail anyways. Um, but yeah, we also have a ton of, like almost every college has a recruit me form. So you can fill in your information and ask for, you know, your connection to the college, um, you know, what other schools you're interested in, what it is you like about that school, and then also has a place for your stats as well as your contact information. So, um, you know, I think that's extremely helpful for us to just to be able to kind of reach out and connect with you. So yeah, definitely take the time when you're looking through your virtual tours to also find your Recruit Me page and shoot the coach an email. Um, if they don't get back to you, it doesn't mean they're not interested. Uh, it just means that we're kind of probably sorting through things going on at work and, and are in our email, just like everybody, right? So um, keep trying. You know, if it's a school that you really feel that is a good fit for you, put in the effort and, and, and keep reaching out and um, try to connect with that coach. And then what about, um, so, you know, you keep talking about a good fit. Are we talking about academic-wise, a career path, um, not just sports? Absolutely. Um, they always talk about the broken leg test, right? So if you were to go to school and you broke your leg, would you still want to be there if you couldn't play hockey? Um, I think it's it's so important to, to think about that test as you make your decisions. Um, you know, what are what kind of academic services do they have in terms of tutoring? Um, you know, what is their library like? You're going to be spending a lot of time just as much as the rink. You're also going to be in the library and the classrooms just as much. Um, you know, even even if you can meet up with a professor, if the admissions department allows that and get a feel for your major um, or what you're interested in, I should say. Um, you know, I think I think definitely looking at job placement rates, internships, um, I think that all comes down to location as well and, and uh, what connections the school has. So, yeah, it definitely needs to go beyond just hockey um, when you're looking for, for a school that's the right fit for you. So you had also said that, you know, you... Um you know, that you, that you should ask questions about the coach's philosophy and things like that. What about like asking questions as far as like, you know, what they feel their, um, you know, what's their practices? You know, how often do, does a team practice? When, where? Because I know like Forest ha has a, a rink right on, on their campus, but not all colleges have that. So do you, do you feel that that might be important if there's travel time? Because remember when you were at Robert Morris, they were... <laughs> You know, the university was in Chicago, the rink's out in Bensonville. So not like, an, and I think the girls practiced at McFetridge. So yeah. it's yeah. not always convenient. Does, does yeah. that, I mean, is that something that a, a, a potential, um, you know, college student would want to ask of the coach? 
absolutely. Especially with your rink off campus. I think, you know, other programs typically will have, you know, a carpool kind of situation. Um, but I think, you know, as freshmen, sophomores, most campuses don't allow cars. Um, so that's something you have to kind of think about when you're making your decisions about where you want to play to. And I don't think it make or breaks your decision by any means if your rink's on campus or not. Um, but I think you have to think about it too. You know, are you a morning person? Are you an afternoon person? Those practices really kind of make that decision about who's playing that weekend, right? So, um, you know, I'm a terrible morning person. I know when I look at Michelle, we had to practice at 4.30 on Monday, 4.30 a.m. on a Monday uh, with, with Robert Morris. And I don't know how much they were getting out of it or if I was getting much out of it too. So um, all good questions, especially as you take jobs too. Make sure you ask what time they practice at, um, you know, and what your commitment is there, you know. But I think, yeah, and I think your travel schedule, you know, are good questions. You know, if you're somebody who, who has a hard time traveling in cars, I'm sure you guys are traveling everywhere um, playing youth hockey. But, you know, if that's something you know you struggle with, you might not want to end up at a school that has a nine hour bus ride. Um, you know, so I think that's something that it's very small when you're making decisions, but it's also something to kind of consider. Um, you know, and I, I definitely think adding that that time, you know, can you make it to class, you know, having to go to the rink and then having to come back and things of that nature. And um, yeah, I think that's all part of the process. It's a really good point, Anita. Well, thanks, Jennifer. I really appreciate all, all that great information. Thank you so much. Sure. So for, um, it, it doesn't look like Lori Markowski is going to make it with us. And I'm sure some of you um, who are attending this webinar know Lori. She's been around um, girls hockey for quite some time now in Illinois. She's the uh, girls hockey director for the Chicago Bruins out in the West suburbs. And um, again, I'm sure she's, she's just very upset that she wasn't able to, to um, get on here and talk to you about what the college life of an athlete is like. I do have some of her information, but I'm going to hold on to that until last. Right now, I'd like to introduce Michelle Lichterman. And if you guys couldn't tell, yes, she is my daughter. Um, I'll let you tell her, let her tell you. Um, her, she's actually a jack of all trades. Um, and I guess that comes from her mom being so involved as a volunteer for so many years and her older brother playing. Um, and her dad having not played hockey himself other than street hockey, um, but he was a baseball player. But she actually really grew up as a rink grad, three days old. We left the hospital, went right to the rink for her brother's hockey game. So she's pretty much grew up around the rinks. Michelle, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. So yeah, so I'm sure a lot of you recognize me. You'd probably recognize me more if I was in my referee um, gear um, and on the ice with you guys. Um, but um, my name is Michelle Lick German. I have been, I've lived in Illinois my whole life. I grew up playing hockey with boys, just like Jen. Um, girls hockey, even when I was young, you know, playing wasn't a big thing, even in Illinois. Um, I grew up playing out in Skokie, Illinois. I was born and raised in Mount Prospect, Illinois. I uh, grew up playing boys all throughout high school, actually. Um, I did get opportunities to play on girls teams um, throughout my playing career. Um, but when I was playing high school boys hockey, I took a really bad injury to my knee and my back. Um, and that kind of ruined my opportunities to play in college. Um, part of the ruining of it is because I went back too early and I didn't listen to the doctors fully. I didn't let my body recover the proper way. And it opened myself up for a lot of chronic injuries that unfortunately to this day, I still deal with. So when your doctor tells you not to play, don't play. We'll get into that in a second. Um, the other thing, uh, so then I started refing. Um, I started refing at the age of 13. Um, back when I started, you could. Now you have to be 14 to start officiating. Um, but it made me form a, a new appreciation for the game. Um, definitely taught me a lot of skills. Um, especially when it comes to communication. Um, I had to learn how to communicate with an adult who I grew up learning that adults, what an adult says goes. Like you need to respect that adult. You need to listen to that adult and kind of their way is the, or the highway. Um, but that's not how it is in officiating um, by any means. Um, yes, you still need to respect the adult. You need to respect everybody. Um, but it definitely taught me how to communicate, how to communicate effectively without, overstepping any lines or, you know, talking down to anybody. Um, definitely a lot of skills that I use every day in my work life now. Um, so I've been an official for going on 17 seasons. 
I am also a supervisor evaluator for the state of Illinois, as well as a certified instructor. I was sent up to Lake Placid, New York last year to become a certified instructor. Let me tell you, if you have a love for the Olympics and you can appreciate the 1980 Olympic World um, Games, Definitely get up to Lake Placid at some point in your life because let me tell you, that building gives you chills the second you enter it. Um, the most amazing experience and place I've visited, to be honest. Um, as I got into officiating through college and everything, um, my injuries led me to my career, my first career, which was athletic training. Um, some of you may know that about me. Some of you may not. Um, as Jen mentioned, that's how Jen and I met. I was the athletic trainer at Robert Morris University, Illinois when she came on as the head coach. And let me tell you, those 4.30 a.m. wake-up calls were not fun. <laughs> I can't believe you brought that up. Um, learned a lot about um, injuries, worked with several doctors that I still am in touch with today that I no longer work directly with. Um, but every so often when I have a personal concern or a family member's got something going on, I don't know the answer. I We'll still pick up the phone and call them or shoot them a text so I can get some answers um, and everything. So again, um, piggybacking off of what everybody says, relationships as you go through um, your hockey career to whatever direction it takes you is those relationships are lifelong and can really take you to amazing places, whether you have planned for it or not. Um, uh, athletic training, as, as it was also mentioned, I then became the director for two years of the Robert Morris Hockey Operations. Um, we don't have a season this year. Um, my position was, a lot of positions were considered non-essential for the university. Um, so they let us go. Um, but uh, I know at least at Ro Roosevelt, there are no sports being played at all, period. They're only practicing here and there. Um, even that's kind of very limited. Um, but what I really want to get into talking about um, those of you that maybe have come in the past are kind of going to know this spiel a little bit. Um, nutrition and injuries. We are in a pandemic. I don't need to talk more about that. We already know everything. Your nutrition is more important than ever right now. Um, COVID's real. Whether you believe it or not, it is. Um, it's affected my loved ones personally. Um, so I, I can speak firsthand that it's real. It's a real thing. Um, taking care of your body allowing your body that recovery time, feeding your body the proper nutrition. And I don't mean McDonald's, Popeye's, KFC, Wendy's, pick a fast food joint. I don't mean that. That's not nutrition. That's not good for your body. Am I telling you you can't ever eat that? Of course not. We all have busy lives even to this day. Um, I still enjoy, you know, the fries at McDonald's because whatever they put in that salt is addicting. Um, but really making sure, especially pre and post, you know, practice or pre and post games that you're really fueling your body for the activity. And then once you are done with that activity, you refuel it. Um, that's getting your proper, you know, meats, your proteins, your veggies, um, your carbs. Um, make sure you get an even balance of everything. Um, you don't want one more than the other because then you're going to throw your body off. The more you take care of your bodies, the more your bodies are going to take care of you and the healthier you're gonna be, not just from injuries, but also from sicknesses, you know, the cold, the flu, COVID, whatever sickness may come, the better you take care of your body, the better you're gonna be able to fight off those things when it comes, if it even affects you. Um, I know as I've gotten older, I did not appreciate the value of taking care of my body. I was sick a lot. And it's, I don't know, I'm sure everyone here has been sick. It's not fun. I don't want, as much as I love a movie day, I don't want to be feeling like poop when I have a movie day. Sorry, I don't. Um, so really making sure you're paying attention to your body. If your body is telling you like you're really fatigued a day, you're exhausted, but you think you have to go to that practice, listen to your body. If you play or practice fatigued, you're opening yourself up to injury. You need a recovery day. You should have at least one to two recovery days every seven days. Um, if you're not getting those recovery days, you're going to get hurt. It's a proven fact, and I hate saying it like that, and I hate being so kind of stickler about it, but I've seen it happen to so many athletes, and it's heartbreaking because then instead of just taking that one day off, you're now having to take like four to six weeks off, and that's even worse. 
Um, and then if you're lucky enough to have a great athletic trainer with me, you get to have fun in the athletic training room. But most people will say, Michelle, as much as I love hanging out with you, I don't want to be back here anymore. Guess what? I don't want you back here either because that means I have to do stuff. Um, so take a few of your bodies properly. Now, injuries are inevitable. We play a contact sport. Things are going to happen. Hopefully nothing ever major happens to you, but it can. Um, that's the risk we play. That's the risk we take when we play a sport like this that we love so much. When you do get an injury, take, let your body heal. Listen to your doctors. Listen to your physical therapist. If you are fortunate enough to have access to an athletic trainer like me on a daily basis, listen to us. You're not going to like what we say. You're not going to like our methods of treatment excuse me, but let me tell you, it will work. And it will save you from that injury that's gonna maybe take you four weeks to recover instead of having it become a lifelong injury like I have. My knee and my back are lifelong injuries because I did not take care of them properly when I was 16, 17 years old. I thought I was invincible. I was like, oh, okay, I'm fine. I feel great. I can walk, I can run. Let's go do this. My doctor kept telling me, your, your muscles aren't strong enough. You need to build more muscle before you can go play a sport like you play. And I was like, yeah, I'll be fine. I think it was maybe within a month, I was back in his office, not able to walk again. Mind you, she didn't listen to mom either, anybody, okay? Well, that goes without saying. Um, but listen, you know, listen to your body. When you do start coming back from an injury, take your time. So when they say only do a half a practice or you can go for a full practice but only you know skate at 50 percent skate at 50 percent don't overdo it because again you got to retrain your muscles to accommodate that long-term play if you have any specific questions about different types of injuries um, there are very common ones with hockey that i've seen um, hips shoulders knees backs are kind of my expertise um, hockey, you don't see as many ankle injuries unless they occur with off ice workouts, um, but you will see them. Wrists and elbow injuries, you'll see them from time to time. Um, but if you guys have any questions about injuries, um, my email is always available to anybody who needs it, has it. You can always reach out to Anita and get that. Um, I'm always happy to answer any questions. I've been a certified and licensed athletic trainer for... I can't do the math in my head, but since 2012, I'm um, sorry, I'm really bad with math in my head. Um, so I've, and I've seen a lot. I worked at, I worked at the high school level when I first graduated college. Um, and then after, after those couple years at the high school level, um, I went full on for five years at Robert Morris University working collegiate. Um, I had five teams when I first started at Robert Morris. So trust me, they kept me plenty busy. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, but if you guys do have any questions about nutrition, what you should or shouldn't eat before a game, what you should or shouldn't eat after a game, that's just as important for practices too. Um, I think everybody here has said it, you know, you're going to, your practices are going to be your tryouts for if you're going to play in that game. I think that holds true at the collegiate level, like Jen does, um, just as much as the level you guys are playing now. Um, I'm working to get into coaching at, um, the youth level more than just the America Showcase team. Um, my schedule hasn't allowed me to jump in on opportunities. I've had opportunities presented to me. I couldn't unfortunately make the time commitment at the time. But let me tell you, I can assure you as a coach mindset, like I, your practices are your tryout for each game day. Um, so you have to come prepared. You have to come ready to work every day. And doing and doing that, that's eating properly. That's fueling your body, not with McDonald's on the way to the rink. That's not with, you know, an apple on the way to the rink. That's actually getting a, you know, a decent meal. Um, do you have to have a five course meal? Of course not. And please don't do that because you're probably going to end up puking on the ice. And then you've got a whole other set of problems to deal with. But it's getting, you know, a decent meal and you get, to, get some protein, get some carbs and get some veggies in there. Um, same thing with a post-practice meal. I do think post, pre and post game meals are more important than a practice meal, but still something to think about. Um, by all means, when I say don't eat McDonald's on the way to the rink, is that always, are you, are you always going to be able to eat something good for you on your way to the rink? No. 
Trust me, I get it. We all live busy lives. Mom and dad are driving, you know, eight different places after they get done with work. You know, they don't, you know, they unfortunately don't have the time some nights to make sure that you're doing that properly. But as you get older, take responsibility for your own nutrition. If you're sitting at home waiting for mom or dad to get home from work, go grab carrots and ranch, go grab, you know, some leftovers, I guarantee you have. Eat that stuff versus going through the McDonald's drive-thru. Um, so that's pretty much all I have for nutrition and injuries. Um, I could talk all day about it. Trust me. Um, anybody, Jen and Anita know I can talk all day, but, um, I can open it up to questions or if there's another topic I, I need to cover, let me know. Yeah, Michelle, I have a few questions for you. So, um, when you first started out officiating, because obviously that's a, a completely different mindset than being an actual player. Um, can you share with, with um, our young ladies out in the audience, what, what made you decide to go into the officiating side of the hockey industry? And then um, how, how, how did you, I mean, I, I'm sure it had to be intimidating at first because here you are a female, um, it, it, you're, you're a female who is in, in a predominantly male dominated industry and you have to have, and you have to try and earn the respect of coaches and players. Yeah. So I'll answer the first part of that. Um, wait, what was the first part of that? <laughs> what got you into being an official got it. Um, and going to that side of, of, of the hockey? So one, one main reason I got into it is because my brother did it. I have a brother that's five years older than me. Um, when I was younger, I was like, I got to do what he does. Um, so I did it because of him. Um, and let me tell you, if you have an older sibling and maybe they are not an official or you have a younger sibling that maybe you can get them into it, it's really fun to work with your siblings. Um, so he was the main reason I got into it. The reason I stayed with it, um, is again, because after I was in high school and got injured and couldn't play in college hockey, um, I knew I'd, I couldn't give up hockey. Um, and it was the easiest thing that I could formulate in my brain to stay involved in the game at such a young age because I wasn't ready to coach. Um, I didn't have enough of that type of knowledge to be a coach and teach kids. Um, I could teach kids how to skate. Um, most of us that have played most of our lives could do that. Um, that's not a completely off the wall thing to, to think about, but it was, I couldn't fathom that I was not gonna set foot on the ice again. Um, so officiating, since I did get into it at a young age, was easy for me to dive into it a little bit deeper in my college career. And it helped me make extra money while I was in college. And I didn't have to get a retail job or a waitressing job because I would just go out, you know, during on Saturdays and Sundays, skate during the day, make my money. And then I still got to enjoy my college nightlife, if you will. Um, football games and all of that fun um, after I was done working because everyone's sleeping on Saturdays and Sundays anyways. Um, so so, so I got into it and stayed into it. So if you had, I'm going to put you on the spot now, like I do with Katie and Taylor, you have one word or okay, a phrase um, that, that you can, that you can give these young ladies, these young women that are on, on the, um, on the webinar tonight, you can give them, you know, I mean, I know we've all used the word confidence, and I, I don't want you to use that word, but how, how did you get that inner strength to say, and not be afraid to say, I can do this? My phrase to everybody, and if you know me in any capacity, I've probably said this to you multiple times, don't give up. Don't give up. The other, awesome. phrase I, the other phrase I live by is prove them wrong. Um, as a, especially as a female official in a male predominant industry, um, I was determined to prove them wrong. I was determined to prove some of the older officials in our, in our organization that I can handle a high school varsity game with these kids that are, you know, 17, 18 years old. And I'm 5'2", 5'4", 5'5", on skates. These guys are 6'5", on skates. But I was determined. I would not give up. I was going to prove them wrong. And I was going to work those games and I was going to be safe and I was going to do my job out there well. 
Awesome, awesome. Jen, I didn't put you on the spot earlier. Yeah. I need a word. I need yeah. a word from you too. I need a good, strong, empowering word Ooh. or phrase to these young ladies that are on this webinar, that are watching this webinar tonight. It is such a good question. Um, you can you think know. about it because I can go to Lori. <laughs> no, well, you would, I mean, I think the biggest thing I would say is uh, be true to you. I think there, there's a lot of, a lot of noise around you, especially right now, the world and the state it's in. Um, I think you need to do what's best for you, you know, and, and obviously in my world, it, there's, there's parents involved in, in it as well. And, you know, you don't want to go where your parents tell you to go. You don't want to go where, where it's not your path. You know, and obviously everybody's decision is is just that it's theirs. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, whatever feels right to you and, and whatever it is that, you know, whether it's hockey related or nutrition and things like that too, like be true to you, do what works for you. And if it's something that doesn't work for you, maybe don't do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Find another way to do it. Um, you know, be true to you and, and know, and again, that word confidence, like have confidence that, that what you're doing is something you believe in. And if you are true to you, you're gonna, um, you know, and so then it won't matter what anybody says, if you really are true to you and you believe in what you're doing. So that'd awesome. be my message. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So, um, our, our, our final speaker of the evening, um, Lori Markowski, again, she is the girls hockey director for the Chicago Bruins. Um, they are a tier two organization, both youth and girls out in the western suburbs um, of Chicago and um, thrilled she can join us. Hopefully she was going to drive safe while she's talking. Lori, take it away. <laughs> I'm definitely, I'm not, I'm not putting the video up because I don't want any of the girls to get ideas here. Um, <laughs> but can, can everybody hear me okay real quick? Okay. Yeah, perfect. No problem. All right. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, just uh, wanted to kind of talk about, I, I'm not sure what was covered because I, I apologize for being late to the, the meeting here, but uh, talk about kind of what it's like being a college athlete and some of the things that we want to be considering when we're looking for the right school, um, you know, to kind of, Jen said was, you don't want to just go where your parents want you to go. That's for sure. Um, and you don't always want to go. Um, it's not always about playing the best possible hockey, but considering that you're getting a good education as well. And that's key when you're considering what university or college to, to go play for. Um, making sure you're making the choice on education as well as hockey. Um, are you going to be happy at that school if, hockey ends early making sure that that decision on wherever you're going to go play you're going to be happy at with or without hockey and it's it's important and it's key because sometimes you can go to a school and a, you were brought on by a particular coach that coach may get replaced your sophomore or junior year and with someone new coming in they they weren't the one that recruited you so if you're not getting the same amount of ice time, are you just as happy where you chose to go to college? Are you still happy with the education and the location that you're at? Those are things you have to be considering when you're looking at the right school. Um, but as far as once you're in there and you're playing, you know, I, I can speak to it. I think anybody that's ever played uh, at that level can agree. I think that one of the nicest things about being uh, <laughs> being a college athlete is I walked onto campus. I went to a school 400 miles away from home. I didn't know anybody. And my first day of school, I had 20 girls that were family to me on day one. And there, there's something to be said about that camaraderie and being on a team and what you get out of that. And they're your support group. They're your network. They're there to help you. Um, and just as much as your coaches are helping you, your professors are helping you, but your team's always got your back. And that's, that's something amazing that you get out of, out of college hockey. Uh, you know, everybody gets a different experience. You know, you could, you could have the same experience as somebody else on your team. You're both doing the same workouts. You're working just as hard as the other one. And for some reason, they're getting more playing time than you. And you can have a completely different experience. So you have to have that in the back of your mind when you're picking the school. 
is this somewhere I'm going to be happy at, regardless of what happens with hockey? Um, Lori, what was it like? I what was it like being at college, being a student athlete? Um, did you find it more difficult to do homework, um, turn in your 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 class lessons or papers on time? Um, was there special concessions made for athletes? Yeah, what I can I can definitely say now. I was not the best student. Uh, I'm not encouraging this by any means. But the best thing for me was hockey because the second my grades flipped, I was pulled off the ice and I was put into a room with a tutor. And that was very helpful for me. Then on road trips, my teammates were basically took over and were tutoring me in whatever subjects I needed help in. Um, it's not your typical college experience. You're definitely, um, you're getting help. Uh, <laughs> some professors help you out a little bit when you're a student athlete they understand you're traveling you're out of town they're getting you your homework uh they're helping you with those things other professors are harder on you um and really it depends on the school and it depends on the class even um but at the end of the day you have like i said earlier you have that support group that's your team and they've all been there and some of them have had those professors and they know how to help you out with that kind of stuff um you're working out a lot I mean, it's not just, it's really not your normal college experience. You're not going and having super crazy weekends, but you're, you're, you're working out five days a week most of the time. And, and sometimes you're doing two a days where, you, you know, you're on the ice a couple of times a day or you're on the ice or in the weight room. It's, you're, there's, it's, a, it's a lot of effort to be a student athlete, that's for sure. But what I can say, and I'll speak to the girls that I coach, they're now at the youth level, they're, they're already working out five times a day. It's something you're used to, and it's something you're, you're just, it feels kind of normal. It's just at a higher, more intense level when you get to that college level. And did you feel that being a student athlete and, um, has helped you um, grow in the in the um, position in the hockey industry that you're in now. Oh, yeah. Um, I I can say when I graduated college, I felt completely lost without hockey. Uh, I did not know. I was. You spend your entire life training and practicing and working on something and becoming a for the best that you can at it. And when it's gone, I took one year off of hockey, and I just was like, this is not what life should be. And after a nice conversation with my dad, he was like, well, what's missing? And we both agreed it was hockey. So I, that's how I started coaching. And it just it felt normal to work a normal nine-to-five job, but then go to the rink at night and have practice and travel on weekends. I I've had the joy of being able to go all over the country with the kids that I coach um, to, to have nice hockey weekends, but like still see different places all over. Uh, it's definitely driven me. It's helped me juggle that work, that work life slash hockey balance. Cause I mean, hockey to me, it's not, it's not a hundred percent work. It's my passion. It's what drives me. And I and I feel like any of these any of these girls looking to go play college hockey, hockey's what drives them as well. It's it's something that brings us together as a community, regardless of what role you play within it. Thanks, Lori. I appreciate you you being able to jump on it and give us some insight to that. So yeah. one last thing before we call this evening, um, Michelle, did you want to just touch base on America's Showcase really quick? Yeah, sure. Um, almost forgot about that um so as mentioned earlier i am the head coach of the america's girls america's showcase team um for the state of illinois um we were un unable to we had a wonderful group of girls that wanted to play on the team last year that we were going to have to hold a tryout for the first time ever um which i was super excited about and then everything that's happening right now in the world put an, an end to that real quickly on, 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 in a very unfortunate situation However, all plans are a go this year. So for this upcoming 
Showcase um, Tournament, which is in April of 2021. And I believe it is down in St. Louis again. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, that's true. That's correct. So it is down again in um, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, it is a four day tournament. Um, so basically we play games Thursday through Sunday, um, depending on how well we do. And we have a lot of fun. Um, there are a lot of college um, coaches that come to watch and scout. Um, but um, there are also going to be hundreds more coaches that are tuned in live to their live stream that they have. Um, so it's not just about the coaches that are going to be in the building. Um, it's about the coaches that are going to be watching via the live stream that the showcase puts out there. Um, so it is very a very wonderful opportunity, um, a very unique opportunity that girls get to be showcased um, for their talents. We pull the showcase team from all girls in Illinois. Um, seniors get priority, juniors and seniors get priority. And then um, we are able, if we need to fill our roster, we are able to take up to six sophomores. So even if you're a sophomore on this call, this is something that you can definitely sign up for. Um, just know that we will hold those positions open for you unless we need to fill it with a junior or senior. Um, they will be taking priority as the college coaches will want to be looking to fill their rosters for the you know, upcoming season or two. And you'll have a little bit more time and can always join us the following round. Um, it's a lot of fun. Like I said, we play games for four days. Um, we're down there. The girls, I, I try to run it um, as similarly as I can to how what they're going to experience in college. So we eat minimum breakfast together every morning. It's mandatory. It's not optional whether we have a game in the morning or not. Um, it gets the girls up and moving. We eat together as a team. Um, I even get my butt up early with you guys, so you're not alone. Um, you girls stay in rooms together, um, rooms of four, and then you'll have access. You'll, well, not access, but you'll know where my room is, and I will be staying where you guys are staying. Um, so that heaven forbid something, you know, happens in the middle of the night, just like when you're in college, if something happens, you're going to go get your coach. Same thing with this showcase. We try to, I try to really um, run it the way you're going to kind of see it in college. Obviously not as much restrictions on it um, because you are there to have fun too. Um, but there is usually a curfew. Um, there is usually a lights out time. Um, and I do do bedroom checks. So again, very similar to how things are run in college. Um, you can't just be up all night, nor should you be. Um, you want to get that rest. You want to be able to give your 100% every game for those college coaches that are going to be out there. Um, we do like to make, keep it fun too. Um, there's, you know, everyone gets a little, you know, flustered and high strung when there's a lot of pressure to perform. So we try to keep it fun and we do one fun at one din team dinner and a fun activity. The last couple of years we've been in St. Louis, we did whirly ball the first year, which was a lot of fun. And then uh, the second year we did laser tag. Um, and let me tell you, that got very competitive very quickly. Um, and there was a lot of fighting for who Anita would be on her team with. <laughs> Not fighting for me. You guys didn't fight for me, you fought for her. Um, but it's a lot of fun. So we try to keep it light for you guys um, in that aspect of it too, um, to make it you know the most out of that experience for you. Um, but that's really all that I've got in regards to that showcase tournament. Perfect. Um, I just wanted to give our panelists one last opportunity. If anybody had anything else to add, please do so now. If anybody um, on the webinar has any questions, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A chat so that we can get them answered. Um, if not, I want to take this up. Oh, go ahead, Katie. I'm sorry. The, the only thing I was going to say when... There's, you know, we talked, there's so much information here and, and I would say, you know, everybody on this call talks about giving back and getting back into the sport, even if they got out of it for a while and finding that love for it. If you do go play in college or you play even women's league after this, wherever you are, it's never really too early to get involved with helping in your local youth associations as well. I think that's just an important piece. And if you go to a college where that team is not necessarily already involved, so like we host, tri we help with tri hockey for free days. We always encourage our associations to work with their local college teams, um, whether that's NCAA or ACHA. And so it's a great way to give back. It, it helps you kind of remember your love for the sport when you were a kid, because you can see other people doing the same thing. And then it also helps both the college program, a little bit more exposure, those girls that are on the ice. The big thing we always say is if you see it, you can be it. So be that role model because 
you all probably had those role models growing up. And so it's, it's never too early to be that role model for younger players and, and give back to the game. Thank you. Um, okay, and with that, um, I wanna take this opportunity to say thank you, deeply, deeply thank you to my panelists for taking the, um, this time out of their evenings to come join us. Um, I really appreciate all of your time and everything that you guys do for not just hockey, but for girls hockey specifically. Um, and that is up and coming and, and I really do appreciate it. And I wanna thank all of our attendees for joining us on this webinar. The webinar has been and is being recorded and you can always catch up on it. Um, if there's something you wanna go back to, just feel free to listen in on the webinar. John, correct me if I'm wrong, but this goes on the AHI's um, YouTube, YouTube channel or something like that. John? Yeah, yeah, you will have a post it. Um, it will go on AHI's YouTube channel? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, with that, um, the webinar is coming to an end, so thank you. Have a great evening. Everybody have a safe and healthy holiday season. Bye.